Wrecker. What's going on? Nick, how are you, man? Good, 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 good. Hey, so uh, remember you and I were in Miami. In, oh, yes. Uh, Not in shorts, but yes, we were in Miami. <laughs> in the November. innovation workshop, yeah, in November. It was That's this right. SIG, SIGDITE, which is uh, Digital Innovation and Transformation and Entrepreneurship. And, and this year, they're going to do it in September in at Case Western in Cleveland, Ohio, by the way. Yeah, that's right. So the special interest group runs a yearly, I guess, a paper development workshop. And it used to run online during the pandemic. Of course, now it's back in person. It was in Miami last year, which was a wonderful event. It really was. And this year will be at Case Western. We can do a little bit of a pitch because I learned that they got um, Eric Brynjolfsson. Is is he coming to give a keynote? Did I get that right? I, I think so. I yeah, no I think idea. so. It'll be, it'll be mm. amazing. Yeah, so it's a really cool lineup already. But, you know, details cool. to come. Yeah, I'll be there. So the in your Eric Brynjolfsson and me. <laughs> we <Yeah. got> that. <laughs> Eric we and got the that. famous Nick Berente. <laughs> so these two will steal the show at the live. Yeah. Which of these two does not belong? All right. So uh yeah. So one of the things are are yeah, the the esteemed Professor Gordon Birch was there. And when I gave That's my right. presentation, I did my usual shtick on every study we do is just a case study. I don't care if you're doing large scale econometrics, I don't care if you're doing a qualita, it's it's a case study and it's bounded. So Gord basically said, dude, you don't know what you're talking about. So <laughs> we decided we'll have him on and we want to talk about econometrics today. So we got uh, Gord Birch on and our good friend Brad Greenwood is also joining us. And today we're going to talk about econometrics. Hi, guys. Hey, Mel. Hey, how's it going? So does this imply that I'm not a good friend? No, you you're are a good, good friend. friend. You're, yeah, you're, you're my good friend too. While while Nick was insulting you or trying to offend you in some way, I was actually coming up and told I told you that I have a little bit of a boy crush on you, right? I said, like, I'm such a huge fan, which is true, which is very much true. Uh, and I never got the chance to say that to you. And now I said it in public. Wait, why do you have a boy crush on Gord? Look, I, like it's the same with, with Gord and, and Brad on a professional level. I think the work that they're doing it's just simply amazing and it's wonderful and you know you may remember that we had brad on uh, in our third episode you were our first guest brad am i the first returning guest do i get like a smoking no jacket? we've got no, a couple right, of no. there you were our first guest on the podcast the first yeah. person we ever invited in the podcast but no we've had a couple like young jin was a returning guest we had a couple others kathy but, yeah. i think and Hila. anyway so what happened then this is three years ago right so i, I wrote an email to brad saying look i don't know much about econom you know is econ can you send me some nice papers and you, you sent me about five or six of them and they were like the best things i've ever read in my life they were amazing they were you know i remember them to this day there was this uh, study about you know like uh, uh facebook use in high schools in portugal there was this great work by sam rance bottom about uh, uh you know what was the medical care there was your own uber work etc so all of these papers were amazing and then uh, you know i came across god's work and that that work is amazing too and it makes me want to do econ of is stuff now i'm utterly ill-qualified for that, but I just like it. I just love that genre and type of work um, and everything about it. That's really kind of you. The I, I'm probably unqualified at this point too. That's I have to keep co-authoring with Gord. Otherwise I'm, I'm, I'm you know, the, the methods get better every year. So yeah. uh, it's, 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 it's cool. Um, but I'm glad you guys. And Gord, like so you're cutting edge. You're the, you're the absolute cutting edge of econometric approaches. Um. I would not agree with the statement. I think it's worth worth qualifying everything that's about to happen on this episode with a statement that I don't consider myself an economist. Oh, okay. here we go. <laughs> I so what use are you? Economic methods, and I, and I know Youngjin fully understands this because I had this conversation with him recently, that a lot of econ of IS isn't really about economics. It's often employing those methods, but often we draw on like social psychological theory and, and other reference domains, right? So... Hmm. I think it's just a useful point to make. Okay, let's let's un let's unpack this, Gord. I mean, because I thought this is the prejudice that is being brought upon the econ IS people from the econ people, not from the IS side, that you're not real economists. What the hell is a real economist, I guess? And what are what are you guys then? I mean, I think economics is a pretty well defined discipline in terms of the types of questions that people ask and the methods they bring to bear to answer those questions. And they're sort of focused on things like welfare and other stuff. And a lot of the questions I ask in my research are not about that. Um, you could loosely cast the research as sort of micro econ in that we're trying to understand individual behavior and decision making. But a lot of the time we bring to bear theory that is not coming from economics at all. And so I, I personally just don't view myself as an economist, um, but I get that 
in the discipline, we have these boxes that we try to. Yeah, yeah that is true. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on how narrowly you want to define the discipline. Like, like if we just like if we back off, because I do agree that the 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 mainstream IS folks are going to say like, you know, you're all economists, you know, you, you use regressions and you're evil and you reject all the papers. Um, and so, like, I understand that side of it. Um, I think like then it's like, well, where do you draw the line? Are are we? Is it a methodological thing? Is it you know, economics is the study of incentives, right? Is if it's that, then yeah. If it's production output, then probably not. I don't think yeah. either quarter I do that. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's it's always in the eye of the beholder, you know, how people see these things. Because um, when I sit next to Evan Starr, I'm clearly not an economist. Well, that's just it. We To say the word economist, I think <clears throat> neither of you are economists in the sense that you're not in economics departments. You're not primarily publishing in economics journals, although both of you probably have published in economics journals. But, you know, I think being an economist means you're in the field of economics. And, you know, we're in the field of information systems or, or management research. So you're by definition in a different field. Uh, so in that sense, depend, if you define it that way, you're not economists. But if you define it the way that you use econometric methods to investigate, right? If you define the field by the method, then sure, the, from compared to me, you're an economist, right? Uh, because you're both econometricians, right? It's all relevant. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, it's yeah. like a minor, a minor point, I guess. Like uh, yeah. you political scientists, a lot of them use the same methods that we use a lot of the time. Yeah. I think it doesn't matter too much. On the other hand, it does matter a little bit, right? God, as you said, like people put like people like to put people in boxes. So the box that people have put me in all the time is uh, I do design or design science or something. And if you look very closely, the, the one thing literally that I've never done is is design science, right? So I've studied design, I studied development and, and these sorts of things, and I'm a European. So naturally, Peter put me in the box. And for a while, I fought the box, and, and I'm like, well, fine. You know, fine. If you want to put me in the design box, put me in the design box. Yeah. If I if I interpret this very widely, then I can see myself in there. And if I if interpret it very narrowly, I'm not in there at all. Yeah. So I I don't use the term economist. I use the term econometrician. Right. So you talk about people's methods that they use, and I think uh, there are a lot of people who use econometrics, and there are a lot of people who use say analytical models, who arguably are are doing economic theory, game theory, something like that. But so I like to use the term econometrician. Brad, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say I, I think the the putting people in a box conversation is always an interesting one because like I, I raged against it so hard in the job market, probably to my detriment. Uh, saying I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm my own thing, and now people just say like, "Oh, and they put me in a box now. I don't care." Uh, yeah. But so probably the the inverse of what you're supposed to do in your career. Yeah, <clears throat> you're supposed to give people the box to put you in. I, I agree on that, to be honest, because I did the same thing, and I sound stage I have to accept it and then help people put me in boxes. It feels like I don't have any data on this, but I f it feels like that helped. And I know, and, and that's certainly advice I would give out to uh, to others is say, like, put yourself in a box, help people put you in a box, because that helps them to differentiate what you do and whether they want you as opposed to anyone else that happens to be in some other box. Whether or not people are in these boxes is basically irrelevant. Yeah, especially on the job market. Because <laughs> yeah. look at whatever senior scholar you're talking to in that one on one. It's like, what box you want me to be in? Yeah, sure, I'm there. <laughs> Sorry, one more, one more clarifying question. So, when I think about econ, I as econ or econometrics or economists, whatever. So, I think of three things. I think of analytical modelers, right? Um, I think of e econometrician, which I understand as people that use econometric methods to study whatever they want to study. And I guess the third genre there is, and I'm now I'm getting very iffy, is uh, people that do these uh, difference in difference experiments. To me, that's like a third box in the box. Am I am I screwing this up? Is that the, like three types of econ people? The analytical model that basically doesn't work with data, just with math. Then the you know econometrician guy that works with panel, and then the experimental guy. Am I am I missing someone or am I blurring them? I think difference in difference is a research design that is often used in economics and empirical economic work. So I wouldn't separate that as a, you know, a third type per se. Okay. The other thing I would say is, is kind of a continuum here. I wouldn't even fully separate modelers from people that work with data because there's something in the middle there too. You can do structural econometric modeling where you have like a, a model that you then fit to data essentially. Yeah. So these, I don't, I think there's not clear 
lines of division based on the methods that people are using. And I'm a little hesitant to define someone's genre of study by the methods they use. Just, I mean, IS is, is naturally, and we know like a very um, multi-methodological discipline. Yeah, and it is. One of the messages I actually would want to put forward today based on the topics we're going to talk about is actually bringing to bear multiple methods to answer your question is something that is happening more and more in the field. And it's something I actively encourage as an editor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that said, uh, you know, record to your point. I mean, I think that there are genres that that characterize different groups. I mean, like that the original wise crowd, the kind of like Avi Seidman's, the like they were like a lot of pure analog modeling. And now like Avi obviously does data work. So you like you could think of like the requisite skills to do that, which like I certainly don't have the requisite skills to do analytical modeling. You know, and then you have the econometric kind of camp. Um and I agree with Gord that the DID is is a methodological approach, the same way like a regression discontinuity is just a design. I think like there's another group that does a lot of like field experiments. Yeah, and, like Bidgu, right? I would put him there. Yeah, Robbie. Um, yeah, you know, it's one that pops in mind. And, and those, I don't think those are different. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. So I completely no. agree with Gord. It's it's that you know it's just preference of what people like yeah. to do and what people you know what they've employed most frequently based on their interests. So I do want to touch on what we talked about in Miami, uh, Gord. <laughs> and I always use Brad's uh, example of whatever drunk driving fatalities in, in California. And, and this is my argument that so, so and, and I take this argument entirely from John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and he, he has this criticism that you guys have probably heard about the Tinberger debate, a uh, Tinbergen debate, whoever, I forget the guy's name, but Tinbergen. <clears throat> so Tinbergen wrote one of the first big books using econometric methods, right? And Keynes came and argued with him and said, wait a second, there's a lot of assumptions you're making before you can use these econometric methods. And what he was shooting for, he, he basically argued that uh, Tinbergen is doing a lot of kind of uh, getting really excited about the math a little too quickly before really understanding boundary conditions and all of that. And what he said is the problem is not with what Tinbergen's doing. The problem is that Tinbergen is striving for perfection with his mathematics without realizing that every study that he's doing is just a case study. And one of the big things that Keynes was arguing uh, around was the, uh, the fact that, you know, the, the parameters are going to be stable over time, right? One of the things that he basically said is whatever insight you have now, if you put in a different context at a different point in time, uh, it's probably going to be different. And there are all kinds of non-quantitative factors that'll come to play, right? So, you know, he made arguments around specification, around completeness, around a bunch of things that I know you guys deal with, but his big one was <clears throat> whatever inferences we have, you know, we need to make assumptions to say that these inferences will hold. So he basically said, Tinbergen's fine as long as every study that you do, you just think of as a case study. No matter how big your data is, no matter how much time you have, because it may not hold in a subsequent time in another context. So just treat each one as a case study and you're fine. The problem is Tinbergen was far too worrying about precision at the expense of thinking more broadly and more generally, right? So my question to you is this, is this a defensible argument still to say, look, we maybe focus a little bit on really parceling out causal inference and we're getting so much into the mathematics, so much into instrumental variables, so much into to, that, that what we're doing is we're kind of not looking up and looking around. But if we were to treat one as a case study, maybe we'd be a little less... Uh, uh, focused on the the beauty of any particular finding, and we'd look at at creating more findings and that sort. I don't know if I'm articulating this well, but do you get the? So my argument is this: that I think Keynes's <clears throat> critique of Tinbergen still holds, even though we've advanced our econometric methods dramatically from whatever Tinbergen said. Do you buy this, or do you think I'm like missing something? Uh, no, I think it would be extremely unreasonable of me to say that. There's no, so the way I think about what you're describing, right? The idea that you might show a result really rigorously in one context and then it may not hold tomorrow because things change that we don't observe. What you're describing is unmodeled complexity. 
to the data generating process. That's how I think about it. So essentially, we've got some representation of the data generating process. It's some reduced form model, whatever, some regression we've set up. There's factors that are at play that affect the outcome, and maybe they interact with our treatment variable, and we don't know about them, and so we ignore them. And it so happens that things work out one way in one data set, one sample, one context. But tomorrow, that thing we're not modeling and thinking about changes. And as a result, it shifts what's going on with the things we do get to see, and results change. So the question is, there's a continuum here of the extent to which you believe that there's unmodeled complexity in the thing you're studying. That's kind of how I think about it. I, I, I think where I took issue with the argument you were making was not the idea that nuance and context matter. I think it would be really unreasonable of me to disagree with the statement that that, that matters. My problem was more with the idea that this is a dichotomy, that things are case studies or they're not. I think that's a false dichotomy. I think it's about degrees of generalizability. And to what extent do you have face validity around the idea that the thing you showed today is going to generalize tomorrow? To the extent that's plausible, I think it makes sense to try to draw generalizable inferences off the thing you've observed. I think it's a continuum. That's it. So, by the way, I didn't say things are case studies or not. I'm saying everything's a case study. Every single study we do, when Brad does his Uber drunk driving fatalities in San Francisco in 2016, he has a huge data set, but it's a case study of Uber and drunk driving fatalities in San Francisco in 2016. It, and, and then you ask Brad, and I did this once when we were having beers. I'm like, well, so how do you know that that would hold in Atlanta at the same time in 2016 or New York in 2021 or something like that, right? And you're like, well, and, and and I'm probably paraphrasing when I bugged you about this, Brad, but you said something to the effect of, well, you, they're both big cities. They're both, you know, it's the same time. Uber was, so you were making logical arguments around generalizing the claims from one case to other cases, which is exactly what, say, qualitative researchers do. And it's exactly what we, you know, uh, now I'm not saying it's equal the exact same thing is a qualitative study. You're getting different things out of qualitative than you would out of an econometric study, but it's a case in that any inferences I draw and attempt to generalize, that's a human endeavor, right? I have to now make the argument, right? So that's so why I, I say it's all case studies. Every bit of research any of us do, an experiment, a right? Sure, but implicitly it's a label, it's a binary label. You think everything yeah. is a case study and you're kind of implying that we think some things are not case studies, that's binary. And my point mm -hmm. is, I think that's a false dichotomy. I think everything is it's subject to degrees of generalizability. So I think you need to think about it as a continuum. So I want to, um, I've, been, I've been hearing this argument by Nick for, for a while now, right? Before he talked to you about it, et cetera. And I don't disagree. I think I agree. Like every, every study in a sense is a case study. Everything is always bounded, of course, time, context, data, God knows, whatever else. Um, whatever you want to call it. And I also agree on the, okay, yeah, we generalize. Data doesn't generalize. Findings don't generalize. We generalize from them. Um, I agree on that too. But Nick, um, so like, I don't know what, what is the so what? Like, what is the, well, what are we doing so wrong if we we don't see things as a case study? Or what should we, what should I be doing differently now that I agree with this observation? You know what I mean? Like, I don't find, I don't understand the implication of your argument. Well, I guess then, so if we all believe that a uh, single that every study we do is just a case study and that it's probably, uh, you know, uh, subject to a lot we haven't uh, anticipated and it may change, then our posture as scholars is not one of, look at my finding and now make policy from it. Uh, it's not, I need perfect. I need to really isolate an unassailable, unassailably significant uh, coefficient, right, in my regression. I can chill a little bit. And and the first is when I present my findings is with humility. And I think that's one of the big problems with management research right now is that, and, and a lot of research, economic, behavioral research, the moment they get a finding, they want to go do a press release about it. They want to get all kinds of notoriety about it. And it's the exact opposite of the posture that an, a scholar should have. We should have the posture that, hey, these are my one little finding and don't do policy based on it, right? What we need is a, a cumulative tradition uh, in this direction. And then we'll have valid findings. Uh, if, you know, the more of these studies we put together, 
the more I can have confidence in them over time. Uh, and then we start thinking about policy, right? So I don't know. I think it, it, it creates a humility, number one. And number two, and this is where my agenda goes with my computational intensive theory construction and all of that. And an econometrician may look at the inferences we draw. Uh, Brad, you've told me I'm p-hacking, I'm justifying p-hacking as a goof, right? And, and the, the idea is we're going at interesting data sets. We might, and these interesting data sets might not be perfect from a modeling standpoint, right? From a strict econometric causal unidirectional exogenous causation, it wouldn't fit that, but maybe we're getting some interesting insights. And if we're holding all inferences to those strict tests, then we're, we're limited to only certain data sets. But if we relax some of our, and we say, look, every study is just this case study. It's just a small little ob empirical observation, essentially. And then we would admit more degrees of freedom in what constitutes an adequate uh, uh, contribution. So I think there's a, there's a lot going on here. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess like at the top, I would disagree with the characterization of all scholarship as a case study, right? Because that like math, pure math is pure theory. Like it's, there's no, like it, it is as far off on that spectrum as you can possibly go. All right. And so there's, you know, th th there's a huge, I think I agree with Gord that there's a huge spectrum here. I, yeah. I do agree that we want to be reticent about doing large scale public policy as a result of one paper, right? We do want like a cumulative tradition. We want a lot of evidence on X, Y, Z and the other thing. And I think that you know, the good scholars who are operating in this space will say that, right? If you look at like what Evan's doing with non-competes, it's not one paper. It's a lot of different papers trying to look at these things in different ways to try and give facts to policymakers or to administrative agencies to say like, well, this is what we know. And as a policymaker, use your best judgment and how you employ those things. Uh, so I, I think that, yeah, there is a lot of room in the discipline for varying approaches that some are causal, some are descriptive, and they're all valuable, where I try to evaluate things as an editor is to say like, okay, what are you saying your research is, right? If you're saying like, I'm going to isolate the effect of X on Y, all right, go ahead and do it, right? And, but I'm going to hold you to the methodological, like I'm going to hold you to the rigor that's associated with X, Y outcome. If you're yes. trying to say something different, maybe you're taking, you know, a cross tabular approach, which is fine. Like, I think there's a lot of good cross tab work that's not identified out there. Okay. Well, my preference then as an editor is that if you're going to take that approach, these insights have to be really important because we can't say that X is causing Y, like you're dissecting this soup. And I think people like Young Jin do a really great job of that. And that's where there's a lot of great room for qualities because you're going to get like this really in-depth insight. I agree, might not generalize, but a guy like Youngjin is going to thoughtfully talk about where it might generalize and where it might not generalize and where we obviously need additional work to keep going. And so like, I agree with you that like when I'm postulating about Uber and drunk driving, one, you know, there's 30 other papers that have showed the exact same thing and one paper that shows that it's insignificant, right? Okay, I'll accept that. But like, can we put on our our thoughtful people hat and say, this is where it's probably going to go. And this is where, you know, I, there's a very reticent case for making that. Is that fair? I think, I think that's fair. I want to, I want to latch onto that two things. So the one is this, I think this tension that you're creating here between doing cumulative tradition, prog highly programmatic research, right? If you want to do this, we should all be do more programmatic, a set of studies on every goddamn thing. You should have done that study in Atlanta. You should have done that in New York. You should have repeat replicated the same thing five years later, blah, 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 right? So that's programmatic work, gets us a more solid basis and so forth. And then we can inform policy. Yes, but, well, that essentially means we need to wait with every important policy decision. And I, I would submit that so sometimes we can't wait that long. Sometimes we are being pushed in a direction where we need quick evidence and we need to make a decision. We can't just wait seven years for goddamn scholars to do their highly programmatic cumulative tradition research. So I think a nice case study, pun intended, on that was actually what happened during the pandemic. If you think about how how policymakers all around the world, they were looking for insights and evidence, not theory, by the way. 
Yeah, they were looking for give me something, and they did a lot of they they switched a lot of levers off. They took our quality assurance levers, like the peer review, post publication, you know, announcement stuff. They said, give me give me the pre review stuff. You know, yes, please release it to the press. Knowing all of the bad consequences we got from that, we had a whole bunch of shitty studies, shitty insights, fake information coming through. And said, like, we don't care at the moment. Timeliness matters more than rigor. You know, and evidence matter more than theory in a way. I, I, you know, that's the way that I would look at it. And in a way, you can tra- you can even translate it to the state about generative AI at the moment. People at at this moment they want to they want to have these first insights. How what will it do? How much? How little? Where? And and you know, so in this moment, I don't disagree with you, Nick. But I think there's sometimes we're being pushed in one thing, and if you push one thing, you will have to sacrifice the other. We can't do everything perfect because if we did, then we'd get into the situation that the the you know the researchers will run the states. We all know that's a bad idea, didn't they? The Greek try that. Uh, if we organized a society based on what we think the best basis for decision is, we would go nowhere. We would still be living in caves. So I, I think this is. I think this the the pandemic is a is a good case study. I think in in how we might want to thoughtfully do this because I think one of the problems in management or you know, more behavioral studies. We don't really have an infrastructure for screening stuff pre-publication. You put anything up on SSR and you can contrast that with something like engineering. So like my uncle is like IEEE fellow, does a lot of wind work. Mm. And, you know, Nick often, this is my, my uncle Nick, will often eschew the peer review process because it slows stuff down and they're trying to figure out stuff on the ground. And like, so they're doing dedicated work. And we don't really have that infrastructure and in, in management in the social sciences. Like we have things like NBER working papers where you're saying like, all right, here's a vetted set of scholars, right? Avi Goldfarb is going to put this up there and Avi does good work and he's, you know, he's been endorsed by the community and we're going to trust him. And, and I don't think that policymakers often have you know, the divining rod to sift between like, oh, this is careful work or, oh, this is not careful work, right? Because they're not always trained, right? And, but I also think that we should be careful about like blaming researchers too much. Like, so like I have a paper on racial concordance and birthing outcomes. The number of people who have have made XYZ conclusions off that paper are just astounding. Mm. And most of them are things that we don't say in the paper. Right. Mm. This is what we find. And we need a ton more work on it. But that doesn't stop random person from saying oh, this is what, what we would say. Yeah. So I think part of what's going on here, like the issue that you're raising, Nick, that we try to draw like direct concrete conclusions from everything in every paper. Part of that is like a normative issue that authors are actually like encouraged to do that, yeah. to make clear what their contribution really is. So I think there's two ways you can kind of push back on that or against that practically in the, like the review process. One is rather than pushing authors to tell us, this is why my thing matters and everything that's affected as a result, it should be more about here are plausible points of connection where this thing may have some implications. The other thing yeah. is limitations, right? Like paying more attention to actually articulating meaningful limitations. And it's oftentimes... The way limitations are written in papers, I mean, this is anecdotal for me, I guess, but it seems a lot like, what are the things I can say negatively about myself that aren't really negative in an interview so I get the job, right? Yeah. It's sort of because people are hesitant to raise real limitations. Yeah. Exactly. I'm going to list all my robustness checks. It could be this, but I ran this robustness check, so it's probably not. <laughs> yeah, like, I have too much data. This is a problem for my paper. Yeah. yeah. It's like the job applicant that says, "Like, oh, my the, my weakest side is that I'm a perfectionist." Yeah, that's the classic. Exactly. All right, so and you know, I mean, I have a political agenda like everyone else. So the first is, I think, humility. I think a lot of if we're if you don't if you see a scholar talking and they're not humble, and fallible, and you know, very tentative about their findings, I think. And, and they haven't spent 20 years studying something. If they spent 20 years studying something, then you can, uh, anyway, so I like humility. But the other thing, and just to tell you where I'm coming from, is this computationally intensive stuff. The moment people would see quant and they would see big data, they would immediately hold you to econometric criteria and endogeneity and all this kind of, and I'm like, well, wait, but that's not what I'm doing. So I've gone through six rounds in review processes where I've had to, 
They want me to create hypotheses. They want me to deal with the instruments. And, and it's like, wait, that's not what I'm doing. I'm generating theory and I'm, I'm using some empiric. So it became a, a kind of hot button for me that, you know, I'm just doing a case study here, but I'm not using qualitative data. I'm actually using some computational, I'm using some quantitative and I'm, but it's all about constructing a theory. And I got annoyed. So I thought that the way out is to just call all studies a case study, right? Some, as Brad said, are intended to get at, say, uh, X and Y, right? Uh, causality. Some are trying to do different things with uh, different sorts of data sets. And, and uh, so I think we're probably, it sounds to me like we're probably in agreement with the, the uh, we're just maybe uh, disagree with some of the framing. At least that's the way I'm going to leave today. Einstein's theory of general relativity, colon, a case study. A case study. Well, that's, that's only different. holds in this universe. Uh, <laughs> the so I did want to ask you this because record doesn't realize this, but when I run around the U S and I meet say PhD students, a lot of them are econometricians, right? And, uh, and this is one thing that I've run into in a number of different research genres with PhD students is that they read papers from say eight years ago or 10 years ago. And then they model their methods and we see yeah. this in like qualitative work, right? Well, they'll read a paper from say 2015 and they'll be, they'll imitate the way that that paper is presented. And believe it or not, in the nine years since, since then, the bar for qualitative research just keeps going up. So the bar to get published in qualitative research now is much higher than the bar in 2015, the papers they're reading. And from what I understand, uh, if I'm using econometrics, right, the, it's like every year, the requirements for instrumental variables for, for so many things are, are kind of moving. So I wanted to pick your brains a little here today about what are some of those frontiers in econometrics, and in particular, uh, you know, this, this whole, that something popped up for me recently was this mechanism, you know, find evidence for mechanisms, which I guess 10 years ago, you didn't really have to do as much, but now everyone's requiring of it. So maybe can you walk us through what's the cutting edge and what are some, uh, some trends you see that in, in the review process with econometric studies? I like that. Yeah. Uh, so what I would say is, I wouldn't say there's like a uniform frontier on all studies that they have to meet this new bar. Like there's these 10 robustness checks that every paper needs, something like that. It's more like there there are certain techniques where we're the constantly the real econometricians are identifying, you know, some issues with the way things have been done in the past and saying like, no, these things are not okay, but here's like 10 new ways. So you should yeah, think the about the ID lit more robust, right? all yeah, the, the DID literature is the best example of this in the last few years. A lot of relatively junior econometricians have gotten a lot of papers in top econometrics journals out of dealing with this issue that they've identified with a really common practice that people have done in the past with estimating DID models that was more based on like intuition, like, oh, the formal theory says this works, which kind of seems to imply to me intuitively that it'll be okay if I use it over here too. But then we actually go and rigorously analyze that practice in that context, turns out that's not a good idea. And lots of things can go wrong. And so we got a whole bunch of new papers in DID in the last few years about, okay, what are ways we can do this that are robust? That kind of thing is happening in parallel in various different domains of econometrics, I think, is a way of thinking so about wait, it. So wait, DID, the, the way I understand it, that's like perfection, isn't it? Like I have a situation and the situation's the same, and then it changes for one, but not the other. And then I compare after the change. That's like... So can you just give me like back of the end, what's the, pro how could that, that's like perfection. That's, that's, that's like for an empirical study. What, what better can you do than DID? Like, what's the problem? Like, so intuition for one of the main problems is if you try to take this logic of what you described, right? There's a single shock. It happens at one point in time to one group and not the other. That's canonical DID and you're right. Assume there are still some assumptions that go with that. It's not random assignment like an experiment, right? So you have to deal, right? There's not, nothing's perfect, right? <clears throat> the problem is when you take the exact same idea and you take it somewhere where it's not one shock at one point in time. Now it's lots of different shocks and they're staggered at different points in time. Oh, so like A-B testing on a, on a digital platform. But also varying in time. So treatment's happening in period one. It's happening in period three for you, period five for you. And we're going to pretend that it's okay to just look at what's the difference between treatments on versus treatments off, yeah. right? That becomes a problem because you get into, for example, an issue of this idea called a forbidden comparison, 
where what you end up doing implicitly with the estimator is some of your estimate is coming from comparisons between groups that have already been treated in the past, that's actually serving as a control and being compared with something being treated now. But if treatment uh -huh. doesn't go up and stay flat as like a step function and it sort of evolves, then now your differences are not picking up on the treatment effect anymore. You're yeah. picking up difference in timings and treatment evolution and stuff like this. You get really biased estimates and they can even flip sign. So hmm. that's what all these papers are all about figuring out how do I get to an estimate that doesn't exploit those comparisons essentially is one way of thinking about it. That's one of the issues that people have identified. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. We're kind of, to be honest, like people in IS are not developing these methods. It's more monitoring what's happening among the people who really do that as their research and trying to integrate it into our discipline to keep us abreast and respectable. And I think that's completely fine. And I don't think that's an artifact of econ or IS econ research either. I mean, like when I when I did my PhD, I did survey research as did everybody else at the time. And you know, then there was the there were all these methodological papers around different ways of doing structural equation modeling. Huge thing. And these papers are always of the same sort. They always take this is the latest standard. Usually it doesn't come from out of IS, it comes out of, you know, whatever marketing, wherever they, they come up with this stuff. And then they review what we do and find out, oh, guys, of these 20 things, we only do four, and the other 16 we've never done, and here are 16 new guidelines. And then 10 years later, you could do the same thing. So my point is, um, isn't that good? I mean, isn't that good that we can't get away with the stuff that we have done 10 years ago that we, you know, because it means our methods get in better methods are a topic of research in themselves. Um, so it's it's good that we have more rigorous ways of estimating difference and differences, just in the same way that we have much better guidelines, for example, for how to do structural equation modeling in goddamn survey research. You don't get away with the stuff that you got away in the 80s and 90s, and it would be very sad if you did, because that means we have, as a field haven't progressed. And also, third point, final point is, I also don't have an issue with these things don't not coming out of IES. Why would they, right? So we are very pluralistic. Are there people in our field that are capable of doing methodological advance? Sure, sure, let them be, you know, let them do it, whatever, I don't care. But it doesn't, doesn't you know, diminish me in any way that I'm saying here's a very good set of new standards for, let's say, experimentation. I don't take an IS paper on experiment. I don't even know a single one. I'm taking the experimentation guidelines and the latest one. And if I were to say one takeaway, if your methodological guidelines in whatever field you're doing is eight, eight, older than five, Five years don't use it is that fair to say yeah i think it, it is fair because things are well so i i don't think something being old by construction makes it bad no no, but no. I, you know look like rcts um you know are universally good and and like medicine's gotten better because medicine somebody pointed out that like hey you should include medicine or you should include women in your rcts um which they didn't start doing until the 90s uh for reasons passing understanding right so I, I do think it's it's completely reasonable that stuff comes from outside the field and it's completely reasonable that methods get better over time because like otherwise like we're not learning. Um, you know, I, I think we want to always be careful about eating our young um, and <laughs> which is like always comes back to the point. It's like, what is the paper purporting to do right? as as an editor and as a reviewer? And if if they're not doing, you know, if if you're holding them to a standard that's an artifact of you imposing a bunch of additional stuff on what the co-authors are trying to do. That's unfortunate. But if it's what yeah. the co-authors are actually trying to do, well, then, you know, you have to play by the rules and the rules are contemporary so, evolving. So two trends that I, I'd like you to talk to if you can, and, and just tell me if I'm off base, but I've seen uh, studies, you know, using econometric analysis uh, presentations recently. One trend I seem to see is the multiple instruments. It used to be one instrumental variable. Now you need to instrument a couple different ways. So I'm seeing that. And then the other trend I'm seeing is mechanisms, right? You used to be able to say A, F, X, Y, and I'm confident about that. <clears throat> and you can't just do that anymore. You now need to say why that that causal effect is there. And then you need to test that causal effect, right? That, that explanation. is. It, are these pretty much everywhere now like what's the standard okay so i think like when it comes to mechanisms right again it's very like native to the question like so if you're coming along and just to keep using the example of like uber and drunk driving this is a relatively well-known thing right so people have shown this 
And so if you're going to do something in that space, well, you need to add something to it. So like mechanisms are a nice way to add to the corpus of knowledge beyond like, hey, you know, it happened in California, it happens in Texas too, right? So we would expect that to happen. Um, You know, that being said, like mechanism is always a nice thing to show because it gives a, a richer, you know, picture, a richer mosaic of this underlying phenomena that people presumably think is interesting. And so- I don't think by construction, like mechanisms are necessary. I think it's really, it depends on what, what you're doing. And obviously the more evidence you can show the better when it comes to instruments. I mean, I think, you know, publishing a two SLS is just inherently getting more challenging because like, there's a lot of really great instruments out there. Like I think the, the, the Rodrigo's paper with Pedro and Rahul that we talked about the broadband in school, that was a great instrument, right? But the number of good instruments is pretty thin. And having multiple instruments also allows you to do other things like produce Sargon values, right? So, so you can, you know, you can't test the exclusion restriction ex- explicitly, but like it gives you a little bit more information. So it does add to robustness. Um, so, you know, it, so I think these things are, are are fairly nuanced and they're very idiosyncratic to the papers that, that you're dealing with. So if someone is a great instrument, you'd be like, you're, you're golden, you're good. But if not, then you might encourage as an editor them to... Uh... Or, or how does that work? Part of the problem is that what's a great instrument is highly subjective because mm. they're fundamentally really assumption driven when it comes to like, is this actually identifying good variance in my variable yeah. or not? It's always going to be based on an argument unless the instrument is coming from a randomized treatment in your experiment, uh, which is, you know, aside from that, you're making an argument and do people buy yeah. your argument? Right. So I, I think the mechanism, so I, I don't know that I would say that multiple instruments is a increasingly common thing. I actually haven't seen that very much myself, so I can't speak to that. But the mechanism thing I do agree is becoming increasingly a focus. I think part of that is driven by an increase in the volume of RCTs that people are running, because especially field experiments, because those are notoriously not great for understanding mechanisms. They're good at identifying a causal effect, but it's harder to say why in a field setting, because I can't go ask people what's going on, because as soon as I ask, they know I'm experimenting on them and we get like observer bias and other like Hawthorne effects and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I think people are more worried about mechanisms as time goes on. There's lots of ways that people can go about getting at them, which is nice. And I think it's actually driving a convergence towards multi-method research. So um, one thing I like, sometimes the data just isn't there in the observational set, this experiment to get at a mechanism. So one thing that I've increasingly been doing is I'll push the authors like, why don't you go talk to somebody post-hoc, like ask them. (laughs) Yeah. What do you do in these situations? Like it's it's still useful evidence that complements what you're putting in your paper. Or another common thing is go run a controlled experiment where you have the ability to manipulate components of what's going on and try to tease out like specific elements. So I really think multi-method research is a good thing and you kind of triangulate effects. And I think it's increasingly accepted as a way of addressing this question, right? So Gord, I have a question on that, Gord, because it, it, in multi-method, like... You know, I've I've done the same thing in a couple of my papers. It's like, okay, well, we'll go talk to a bunch of clinicians and say, like, what do you think? Like, what what might be going on there? Where I always get really squirrely about doing that is like, I am not a qualitative researcher by any possible means, and I I always get squirrely about putting too much on that. So I don't know how you guys think about this problem, like from a training perspective. Well, wouldn't that just be just get a just get an expert onto your team? I mean, like, just get someone yeah, to help you yeah, with but that. But if I ask Berente to come in, he's going to be like, no, don't ask him. He's like a horrible co <laughs> theory of the idealized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't ask him. No, 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 no. And then it's going to be a, a book. I don't want to write a book. Uh, yeah. Wow. But, <laughs> well, from a practical standpoint, it's multi method, but there's always implicitly greater focus on spe- one of the methods in the paper. It is not, we're presenting all of these as parallel equivalent yeah. to you, right? Because as soon as you do that, if I have three methods in my paper, I'm getting three different reviewers, each of whom knows one of the methods, and they will focus on just that piece of my paper and say, you don't have a yep. complete paper. Yeah. And then the paper yep. died. So usually well, it works out in practice. You have the focal thing, and then you complement at the tail end with some additional things that are, I'm not a qualitative researcher, obviously, but I can talk to some people and I can at least get some quotes that support what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I, I do think that's a that's a shortcut or a shorthand. Let's not call it a yeah. shortcut. It's a shorthand. It's a li- little bit of a temporary thing to sort of, you know, boost your own capabilities or whatever, and to deal with the review problem, which I do think exists. The multi-method reviewing is very much, here's requirement for A, plus the requirements of B, plus the requirements of C. 
end story is always your paper is rejected from one perspective or the other. So that's one issue. But from the author's perspective, I do think the the better solution is in fact to to build these teams, right? So last year we gave this award to uh, that analytical modeling and interpretive case study paper that had an analytical modeler. I can't remember his name, and it had a, a Supra as the qualitative guy, right? And you know, last week or you know, in the last episode we talked to Hila about her work on generative AI, which was with an economist. Uh, with her as a, as the the qualitative person, and they had an experimentalist, etc. So they built their teams to have the expertise. Now, Brad, to your point, does that make the entire endeavor more complicated? Absolutely, it does. Right? So much more coordination, shared language is an issue, all these different stuff, right? And the reviewing is still an issue, but you know, at least this way, um, you know, you can be really good at what you're doing. I think, and you don't have to do everything yourself, which is a plus. So have you seen a, like a, I don't know, prolific study in more of an econometric analysis and then they identified the mechanisms, maybe using a little design? And then does the review process ever go in that direction then where they start criticizing the prolific study and treating it like now like an experimental study? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like the, does the or, or have you found that they pretty much give you some some latitude in the review process? Uh because I feel like experiments, we all we all think we can do experiments, right? I, everybody thinks they can do experiments. <laughs> yeah. Everyone thinks they can do a good <laughs> case study too, actually, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't think I can, I can't speak to, uh, there's nothing top of mind as far as like a prolific paper that is an uh, example of this kind of thing. Um, and I can't say that it always goes one way or the other. I think a lot of it's dependent on the editor's receptivity to this approach, this idea of triangulation. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's, yeah, again, it's it's a taste-based thing. I, I hope that the taste becomes more common for this stuff. Yeah, I mean, one trend that's super cool, which I like, is like Katie Milkman's stuff, like the mega studies where we're going to run like 55 or 100 studies simultaneously. And then we're going to publish like the aggregate of everything. And I, I think, you know, you'd probably get away with it because she's Katie Milkman and everything that she does is awesome. Um, Wait, what does she study? I don't know what you're talking about. What is, what uh, is the... I can send you some sites. It's, I think they had one in PNAS not too long ago. Um, okay. um, How to get people to show up for flu vaccines, maybe? Yeah. Like so, it's like mm -hmm. okay. Well, instead of like running this in one location, we're gonna we're gonna have like thirty teams run it in different locations simul That's simultaneously wow. and figure out like where you see it, where you don't see it, and and I think I really like that paper, kind of because I mean it it takes the approach very seriously but doesn't take any of the individual findings too seriously. It tries to look at the patterns and differences about where they see success and where they see failure, you know, like why might wow. Walmart and, and the experiment be different than like Walgreens, like, and who goes there? Uh, so, you know, I think it gets to your point of humility. It's just like, it's like, okay, this is generally what we see does work. This is generally what we see doesn't work. And this is where we see a lot of differences that we don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Oh, that's cool. I got to check that out. Yeah. All right. Well, now we have the new bar for research. We do. I just want to, I, I want to bust one myth. Okay. So uh, help me, help me bust this myth. So I think the myth about I as econ or econ people in general is that they grab a data set, they run around some regressions and they write a paper about it in this order. It starts with a data set, you look at it, try to find something, and then that becomes your idea. Now, I'm hoping you help me bust the myth because I think it's literally the other way around. You uh, come up with an idea and then you search very hard to to construct the data set. Or am I, am I wrong here? Is the myth correct is, is what I'm asking? The two of us as co-authors is like is like a good case study in this. I often have ideas that I have no idea how to test and I'll text Gord randomly. If I, and he's like, oh, you could just do it using this thing that I've never heard about in my entire life. And I go, what's the <laughs> effect? And he texts me 45 minutes later. He's like, I found it. It's this. I'm like, okay, well, it's time to start writing. Right. But I think the other happens sometimes wow. too, <laughs> where like you see something and you text me and you're like, hey, wacky pitch guy, like, like, can, can we frame this? And we're like, oh yeah, like we could like plug this into this. So I think there's a lot of different ways that these things emerge. Like it, it's very idiosyncratic to the study itself. But I think like behavioral people just assuming it was like, oh, I found a data set. Like I'm just going to run regressions until I find something. I'm sure there are people that do that. I don't think it's a very successful strategy. No. Yeah. 
it's a circle, right? Like you, you, there may be situations where you do come come across like this is a really interesting data set, and you kind of think about like what can I learn from this data, and then as you start to work with it, you get a better sense of like, oh, well, what are questions that came out of my initial research that I can now continue to address? Uh, like I, I think it's it's neither one nor the other. I think there's a mix of both going on in the discipline. Uh, so it's not a total myth, but it's also <laughs> not the whole not story. Not a total truth. All right. So, so before we wrap up, what's the, what do you want to, what advice? We have a lot of young people like PhD students and, and junior faculty listening to our podcast. What, uh, what do we want to tell them? Uh, you guys are editors, you're prolific scholars. What should we, let's leave with a little bit of advice. Uh, I would say know your audience. I think one thing you may take away from this episode and this podcast generally is that people have differing opinions about things. So I think it's a Duh. good idea <laughs> get to know editors, like go to conferences and talk to them and see what types of research they do and see what their style of work is and what they like and how they think about things. And then pick your audience when you're, when you're pushing your research, uh, you know, find a receptive audience. It's very difficult yeah. for a junior scholar to do though. I mean, you know. I mean, yeah. You asked me for advice, not how to implement it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brad, how about you? I mean, I think the for me, like in an editorial capacity and in a co-author capacity, and this is like one of the reasons I love working with Gord, is that like it asks interesting questions, like just regular interesting questions that you could say to anybody on the street, like, is this interesting? And they'd say yes. Right. So like I feel like a lot of juniors get so, and doctoral students get so wrapped up about like, I need to publish, I need to publish, and they just grasp at anything, right? And they say, oh, we've looked at X, we've looked at Y, but we haven't interacted X and Y without ever backing up and saying, like, who the hell cares about interacting X and Y? <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, I love that so much. <laughs> right? And so like, I don't think publishable and interesting are synonymous. But if you focus on interesting, it'll get published somewhere. Like someone will find a way to go through. And like th those are the papers that like completely jazz me during the review process is like, and I'm willing to let more things slide is because it's like, yeah, you guys are going after this cool thing that nobody's talked about. And it's just like interesting. I totally agree with you. If, it me too. Jazz, if I'm excited by it, then, you know, I'll cut them some slack. Absolutely. And, and the second thing, like once you do that, earnestly engage with the review team. Like most of the time, the review team is not trying to tank your paper or the editors certainly aren't trying to tank your paper. If they want to tank your paper, they wouldn't have given you an R and Right. So it's yeah. like, you yeah. know, read the comments for what they were and don't try and dodge them. Like if you can't do it, you can't do it. Just say that and say, we were trying to do this other thing. Or we're like, we're, we're like trying to address the spirit of the comments, not like this reduced textualism of like how can i like weave my way through it like you know, sometimes you have to <laughs> but like but like take the review process seriously and your paper will get better at least after the first round after the second round maybe we have decreasing marginal yeah. didn't tell that didn't tell that story once that i worked with a a co-author that i've never worked before we got an r and r and he said oh let me draft the response letter we haven't done anything yet we haven't started the revision but he said i'm going to start on the response letter yet and he comes back with his response letter where he has all the comments and to every comment he has already the response and there's this slimy you know kiss the reviewer's ass type of Thank you so much for this invaluable comment on every single comment. I was like, what are you doing? Yeah. So that's not what you mean, Brad, right? So this is a, I thought like that was a horrible strategy. So I'm like, well, no, like, just, let's just, I mean, I think that well, there's something to being polite and be like, you know, this is a great idea sort of stuff. When it's a great idea, say it's a great idea. But I think it's like, um, I'm trying to think of things. Oh, so I like this paper with, with Dom gut and Jen for it's a, uh, it's it's in it got R and R at ISR and you know like it's on like stars and when stars leave a platform like what happens to the rest of the people on the platform do they keep producing do they not produce and like the reviewers made a bunch of fairly reasonable comments you're like you're studying one star that left right so like how much can we actually generalize from it? it's like okay well that's a good point we're gonna try and replicate it with some other stars that leave but there's not a lot of stars out there so it's like we're going to do our best to actually address materially the fact that we only have one person. We'll put in the limitations, start talking about the stuff that we talked about at the top, like generalizability. Why, you know, under what circumstances would we expect the same behavior? Maybe like under what circumstances wouldn't we think? So like trying to like really 
believe what the reviewer is trying to say in the assumption that they're acting in good faith and acting good faith reciprocally to them. Yeah. You know, and then you get really mad, like on page 40 of the document, because you're like, it keeps going. Hmm. One thing I just wanted to just to at the just the tail end to quickly circle back on this idea, like make sure you're asking an interesting question before you start doing anything. One piece of advice that I give to like junior co-authors to directly address this, make sure you're going to be able to write the end of the paper first before you get started. Like be able to write some, and I know this goes a bit against our earlier conversation, Nick, but be able to think about what would implications be of this research regardless of whether it's an up or a down finding, be able to write about discussion. Like if you can write that first, then you know you're golden, but don't wait till the end of the paper to start figuring out why this matters to somebody. That's a very interesting strategy. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> That's very well, nice. Like Ritu used to do something similar, but like on the front end was like, can you explain, can you cite free write your paper? Like, can you just like explain the, the introduction drawing on zero literature and just like explain from first principles why someone doesn't know the answer to your question. It's like, if you can do that, like you're in a pretty good spot because then you go get the literature and you say, oh, look, well, okay. Unless somebody's asked the exact same question, like then you're in a pickle. But like, if you can do that, you're usually in a better position. Wow, this is two very interesting new strategies that I at least I haven't heard of before. So, you know, hopefully the people that actually listen to the very end of our episodes, they tend to be rare, to be honest. So I hope this is a little really? gem at the end. Yeah, I think so. You know, most people, they, they cut off after 50 minutes. And I think we are at an hour now. And, uh, you know, we, we need That's to too long. To we should stop at 45, right? Well, we'll just take your ramblings from the beginning. I'm just going to cut them out. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Well, listen, Brad and Gord, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Yes, I feel like we could have talked for another couple hours. Thanks yeah, so I have much. To read for IP and antitrust class tonight. You do and do your studies, gentlemen. It was an honor talking with you. You're both all stars. So thanks very much for coming on, and have a good one. Yep. Thanks, man. Thanks for having us. Take care.